Good morning. Is it morning? For me. I've only been up for about two hours, so around here we call that morning. Everything around here is, of course, relative. And where is here? <laughs> Would you like some coffee? Tea? Anything with caffeine to keep you alert and keep your mind clear? No, thank you. Some water, then. Something to keep your throat from drying out as we have a chat. I am pleading the fifth. If you're offering to get me something, I'd like a lawyer. I see. Well, to begin with, while I'm not going to explain precisely where you are, I can assure you that you are not on American soil. You don't have Fifth Amendment rights. You are also not guaranteed the right to an attorney. Not that a lawyer would help you. There is no attorney born to the human race who is familiar with the laws under which you are currently being governed. This is largely due to the fact that these laws are subject to change whenever we darn well feel like it. I don't understand. You messed with time. You ignored the butterfly effect, the grandfather paradox, all the classic warnings delivered by every story ever told about time travel, and you messed with time anyway. I knew what I was doing. And the frightening part, Miss Fairchild, is that you believe that statement. The absolute rank amateurs don't know enough about the science to be a threat. They break into a time monitoring station, tell the computer to send them to the same location 500 years in the past, and then die in the vacuum of space because they forgot to account for the fact that planets move. Then, there are the ones who get to the right location, but they're surprised to learn that somehow going back in time to kill baby Hitler doesn't end as well as they think it will. Then, we have people like you. People who really think they know what they're doing. You're the ones we need to worry about. A guy in blue jeans and sneakers standing next to the crucifixion is pretty easy to spot. Pulling them out of the timeline is like moving a couch. It's easy to see what needs to be done, and you know exactly when you've completed the job. You had to get subtle. Dealing with people like you is like pulling a teaspoon of salt out of a cup of sugar. So, to sum up, you are going to tell me exactly what you did so I know where in the sugar bowl to start looking. I have my rights. You really don't. You see, unlike you, we actually do know what we're doing. I have, in the course of previous investigations, gone back in time and erased the Fifth Amendment from the Bill of Rights before it was signed. I've convinced the boys at the Magna Carta signing that trial by jury was just asking too much. Then... After I got the information I needed, I went back and put those things back where they were supposed to be. You have whatever rights we say you have. And who is we? Well, my name is Helen. That doesn't answer my question. We are the people who know how to erase you from existence. We can make sure your father was out of town on the night you should have been conceived. It very well may be the easiest way to clean up the mess you made by making sure you never had a chance to make it. No one will tell us we can't do this, because there is no oversight over us. There is no oversight, because anyone who might have suggested that there should be at any point in the past has been nudged, so they never got around to it. We're probably going to need to nudge you as well. Your level of cooperation will determine how hard. You can't keep me here. Oh, we can, Juliet Fairchild. I can walk out the store and come back in five minutes for me. You will have been here a week with no food or water. It's all relative, remember? This isn't right. I have an understanding of time you cannot possibly comprehend. Therefore, I am particularly sensitive to people wasting it. Forget what you think you know about your rights and what we can or can't do. We can do anything. And if you try to resist us, we do this the easy way, and you cease to be a problem. Or, really, cease to be anything at all. Tell me what you want. I want you to start at the beginning. Shall I compel thee to a summer's day? Stop! This above all to thine own self be true. My, your accent is terrible. But soft, what light? No, not that play. I mean it. Um, 
All right. Not the sort of thing I expect to be a hot-button issue. Do something from Two Gentlemen of Verona. Who knows something from Two Gentlemen of Verona? You should. Your name is Valentine. And that means... <sighs> He's one of the Two Gentlemen? The ones from Verona. You're impossible. Do you want to go to the play or not? Hamlet in the park. Why did you ask me? So adult humans have these things called relationships, and one of the customary features of these relationships is spending time together, often in a recreational setting, such as... Uh... All right! But why Shakespeare? You like Shakespeare. I loathe Shakespeare! Then why do you know the names of the two gentlemen of Verona? Why is there a book of sonnets next to your bed? Why do you ask me if I know I'm quoting Shakespeare every time I say I'm in a pickle? Why do you say you're in a pickle? Leave my adorably quaint speech patterns out of this. We're talking about you, and why you are the expert on all things Shakespeare, and yet you claim to loathe the man. Try growing up with two English professors for parents. They read me Shakespeare as bedtime stories. I was in kindergarten before I realized thee and thou weren't words anyone else used. Sure, I know Shakespeare, but I'm kind of sick of him. Every guy I ever dated associated me with someone who died tragically, and they thought it was romantic. Do you know what that's like? Remind me to tell you the history of St. Valentine some day. Touché. So, you don't want to go see Hamlet? Why do you want to go see it? Ah, well, you see, adult humans have this thing called money. Unless, of course, those adult humans are attending a university. Then they don't have this thing called money, and they need to find creative ways to spend time with the people they care about. So you're broke, and the admission is free. Isn't that what I just said? But we don't have to go. Not Hamlet. Sorry. I would see a comedy with you, but not one of the tragedies. I am named after a tragedy because my parents were more in love with the words than the plot. Therefore, I do not go to see tragedies. Well, it's in rep with another play. They're doing double falsehoods on Sunday. Is that a comedy? Technically, yes. It's not funny like a modern comedy, but everyone ends up happy. Well, technically happy anyway. Shakespeare would have thought it was happy. Oh, that's a Shakespeare play too? I'd never heard of it. I hate to keep saying this, but yes, it is one of his plays. Technically. It's one of his lost plays. How can they perform a lost play? Did they find it again, I assume? Well... Technically? Shut up. But yes. They've known about this play for a while, but now they're fairly sure he was the writer. But there are other lost works. Love's Labors 1. Love's Labors 2. Val! Sorry. So we'll go see the Technically a Comedy on Sunday. Sure. What do you want to do tonight? I shall fly to Stratford and start digging in people's gardens. And yea, verily, I shall find a new lost play, and it shall be a true comedy, and I will memorize it and learn it by heart so I can quote Shakespeare at you which you've never heard of. That was totally a joke, you know? Hmm? You got super spacey just there. Just an idle thought. Care to share? No. I choose to be a woman of mystery. So what are we going to do tonight? Well, adult humans have this thing called streaming videos. I'm thinking a heist movie. I did mention the dangers of wasting my time, did I not? You said to start at the beginning. That was the beginning. Valentine gave me the idea. A lost play by William Shakespeare. If I could find one, it would be a miracle. If I could make one... It would be a cash cow. Yes. Even if I were eventually found out, if I could fool the academic world into believing what I found, it would be like the Piltdown Man. A hoax which changed history. I caught a man once who tried to go back and expose the Piltdown Man before it could catch on. I rather liked his style. What did you do to him? You don't want that answer. So the expert on Shakespeare gets it into her head to fake a Shakespeare play. There were problems, though. Getting paper that was old enough, the ink that they used in the Renaissance. Never even got that far. Writer's block. Do tell. I can't write like Shakespeare. He was... Good. You don't say. I grew up with it. Constantly. 
it was so familiar. I never realized. You never realized that it takes a certain amount of skill to write plays people still read 450 years later. And that was only part one of the issue. My parents loved Shakespeare. I'd been exposed to him in utero. I honestly believed there was no way anyone could know his work better than I did. Turns out... Not so much. For every word Shakespeare wrote, there's thousands of words written about what he wrote. 450 years of study, of parsing over every single sentence. We went from idolizing him to thinking he couldn't possibly be real. He went from being Shakespeare, to being Francis Bacon, to being De Vere, to being Shakespeare again, and then last year when they found that arrest warrant, and now we think he's Francis Bacon again. People know this man. People love him. They breathe him in. They obsess over him. I came to realize faking Shakespeare would be next to impossible. And then something changed. September 18th, 2044. The first time satellite was launched. And that was what? 15 years ago? Degrees in history and computer engineering. It's kind of on the nose, don't you think? I started with computers because my parents were English professors, and I wanted to be as far from that as possible. The history degree came later. I got interested in my sophomore year, and I took so many electives, I figured I might as well double major. Was there a specific time period you focused on? Renaissance Europe. Hmm. Well, we're a few years away from that. The further back you go, obviously, the more energy which needs to be expended. We pushed back to 1877 so far, and there's a lot of work to do in that period, not to mention the upcoming work we'll need to do on the American Civil War once we get to that point. However, there's still a lot of interest in that project, and funding is still pouring in. We might one day get as far back as Roman Empire, but that's a future project. A future project to go further in the past? <sighs> I'd like to say the irony will wear off, but lying to prospective employees seems ill-advised to me. So... Explain to me, in your own words, what it is you think we do here. Well, I'll be honest. I don't understand the science behind the time travel. Like, at all. Something about antimatter and using supersymmetry to turn a quark into a wormhole? You're right. You don't understand that part of the process at all. Like I say. But however it works, you take a satellite and drop it off in a high orbit around the Earth in the past. Then, you record... Well, just about everything you can using the cameras and other sensors on the satellite. After a set period of time, you pull the satellite out, download the data, and prep it to go back out for another scan of another period. I've seen some of the photographs, and the detail is spectacular. That's it in a nutshell. The position we have in mind for you is basically to ride herd over a few teams in the pre-work. We'll need you to work with the historic office to determine where we should focus our cameras to get the most helpful details. Then you'll be working with the code monkeys to set it up so the satellite actually captures that data. Everything has to be quadruple checked. We were off by a few decimals on one of the 1910 expeditions, and we have months of footage of a rarely trafficked part of the Indian Ocean. I can do that. I'm good with precision work. And I'm good at recognizing when someone's eyes are too glazed over to do precision work. You really mean that? I do. Historians looking at old documents and programmers proofreading code do more or less the same thing. I've done a lot of both. Then, if the terms and salary are acceptable to you, I'd like to formally offer you the position. We need bodies working on this, and we need them soon. Thank you, Mr. Giuseppe. I certainly accept. Good. And you should probably start calling me Stefano. Can I ask a few more questions? Oh, please do. Are there any plans to move to locations other than into orbit? Maybe using stealth tech to keep them unobserved? We're only seeing a top-down view. And while that's a million times better than what we had before, we basically miss out on everything happening under our roof. I don't know. Is that sort of thing even possible? It's tempting, isn't it? We'll never be able to plant a camera inside Independence Hall to watch the signing of the Declaration, though. For one thing, as good as stealth tech is these days, it's still tech. A military drone having a technical glitch could cost lives. An observation drone having a glitch in 1893 could cost us the timeline. Imagine how the world would change if someone reverse-engineered the microchip right before World War I. In orbit, at least we could be sure our satellites will burn up before they could reach anyone. So I suppose no one will be taking trips to go sightseeing in ancient Egypt. <laughs> we can only hope not. Besides the millions of other problems with interacting with the past, there's a butterfly effect to consider. If you went back for even a minute, 
displace just a few air molecules, not to mention the simple act of breathing, you could change weather patterns for a millennia. How many battles were won or lost because of muddy terrain? It's just entirely too risky. Well, I guess that it means it stays such stuff as dreams are made on. So even then, you were planning to go back? Yep. The whole butterfly effect didn't put you off the idea? Catastrophic changes to the timeline didn't make you think twice? I thought twice. I just decided to do it anyway. Because? He owed me. Come again? Shakespeare. He wrote some stupid play, and my name became a cultural icon. Juliet the lover. The doomed lover. Valentine and I broke up. And then the next guy. And the next guy. Two days after I got a job working for the Time Satellites, my fiancé left me for an actress. And Shakespeare's to blame for that. He cursed me. Every girl with my name, probably. But I think I was the one exposed to him the most. I knew every turn of phrase people used, which actually came from him. So not a day went by that I didn't think about it. A writer from 450 years ago cursed your love life. Does it matter why I did it? It matters that when I point out how terrible your logic was, you changed the subject. Particularly since you claimed to have known what you were doing. But no, I suppose the motives weren't all that important. So what was your plan? <laughs> I changed plans a dozen times. At first, I was going to sneak into the globe at night and steal the prompter script. But it seemed likely I'd get caught, and the thought of a Tudor England prison... Sound decision. Nobody bought scripts back then. It would attract too much attention to try. In the end, I decided to forget about getting a copy of a lost play. So why go back at all? For a lost poem. And as we walk along... I, I could have met him somewhere other than at the Globe. I know. But it would have been like going to Paris style. and never seeing the Eiffel Tower. I'd purchased a few Elizabethan or... coins from collectors and learned enough metalwork to melt down some silver and make my own. For clothes, I found specialty shops online, drove there and paid cash. Hand-stitched natural fabrics, using only natural dyes. You wouldn't think there'd be so many people who still do that. I paid through the nose and came away with something that made me look better off than most, but not so wealthy people wondered why they didn't know me. I paid for a balcony seat because there was no way I could deal with the smell of being in the groundlings. Not to mention that one pickpocket can ruin my whole plan. You wouldn't have liked the show. Too much noise from the crowd. Too much overacting, trying to make up for the lack of being able to hear the actors. It's too strange to be real. When the play ended, I followed the crowd outside. You'd think, with as bad as the portraits of him were, it would have been hard to pick him out of a crowd. You'd be wrong. Master Shakespeare! Master Shakespeare! Are your words for hire? Can some weight of silver make a poet take to his pen as it can make a smith take to his hammer? For the most erudite wordsmith ever born, he took freaking forever to answer me. It's con, lady. Other than going to the theater, I spent nearly every minute in an inn not too far from the theater. I bought broadsheets and books of poetry from a local stall and camped out in my private room. That was as close to minimizing my interactions with the past as the plan would allow. I was bored to tears, but I was also fairly certain I was about to be stupid rich. I'd take everything I bought, hide it away somewhere no one could find it for 450 years, along with a brand new sonnet by Shakespeare, and claim to have discovered it. It took him a few days, which, frankly, I think was too much for a sonnet. But what do I know? He met me at the inn. Well then, Master Shakespeare, may we lay aside courtesies? Speak the speech, I pray you. In the old age, black was not counted fair, or, if it were, it bore not beauty's name. But now is black beauty's successive heir, and beauty slandered with a bastard shame. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, faring the foul with art's false borrowed face, sweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower, but is profaned 
if not lives in disgrace. Therefore my mistress' eyes are raven black, her eyes so suited, and they mourners seem at such who, not born fair, no beauty lack, slandering creation with a false esteem. Yet so they mourn, becoming of their woe, that every tongue says beauty should look so. So you see where I was stuck. Sonnet 127. You know the sonnets? I dabble. It was the first of the dark lady sonnets, yes? I always had dark hair. But something about the time travel. Something we didn't know about. It tanned my skin. Actually changed my eye color. I noticed the tan, sure. But mirrors were expensive in the Renaissance, and I hadn't bothered to get one. I'm still getting used to looking at myself in the mirror. I might as well tell you. The effect will fade, at least until your next trip into the past. We've set a few booby traps along the known time corridors to make finding transgressors like yourself a bit easier. One of the side effects is a darkening of skin tone and eye color, sort of like the exploding dye you'd put in a bag of money stolen from the bank. But more subtle, since we wouldn't want reports of a purple human popping up in popular mythology. Sorry, I stopped listening after you said your next trip into the past. Time appears to like you, Miss Fairchild. You've managed to turn yourself into a historical figure, which is a stroke of luck beyond anything I've ever seen. And so, I now cannot erase you from time, and, in fact, I'm going to need to send you back, at least until sonnets 128 through 154 are written. And after that? You'll come to work for us, I suspect. Time doesn't like a lot of people. The ones he does, well, we want to keep them close to us. Can I ask a question? You'll have many, so you may as well. What happened to Shakespeare after... After our agents came and collected you? Funny story, that. Come on, you crackhead! And you, Terry, wilt thou be carted off as was that dark lady? I'd have seen your shadow in that dark in my house when those who were here before return, and yet they shall ask after you. Oh, aye, and it cannot be else. Well, fear not, William. Your name shall not fly from me. Yet, eh, uh, who shall I say was here? Who shall I? Tell them any name. Tom or Nick or Francis. Aye? What, what Francis? Bacon. I am Francis Bacon. Shakespeare is bacon. Right, and so it shall be. Now off with you. You've been listening to A Winter's Tale, Act 4, Scene 1. Produced by Seat of Our Pants Players, written and directed by Dan Wenzel. Juliet was Andy Gastingy. Helen was Jill Wenzel. Valentine was Dan Wenzel. Stefano was Adam Gastingy. Shakespearean players were Andrew Dell and Rick Tennant. Bard off the landlord was Richard Mooney. And William Shakespeare was Dan Kostelik. Music and sound effects by www.freesfx.co.uk Thanks for listening, everybody. Unto thee shall we speak anon.